Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Authorities in Hines County, Mississippi say that the search is on for a pair of escaped inmates this week after they and two others broke out of a local county jail at the end of last week. According to reports, the incident began sometime on the night of April 22nd when four inmates at the Raymond Detention Center managed to breach a cell and part of the roof of the facility. It's believed that they climbed up and out onto the roof where they may have camped out for a short time before fleeing the jail and going their separate ways. While news of the jailbreak was quickly reported and the public was advised to take safety precautions, the first major update in the case didn't come until April 26th when it was announced that one of the fugitives was dead. The man, later identified as 22-year-old Dylan Arrington, had been tracked to a home in Leak County where he reportedly engaged in an armed standoff with police. During the shootout, Arrington shot a deputy before at some point setting fire to the residence. He was killed during the confrontation. Though the injured deputy is said to be in stable condition, sadly, the same cannot be said for another of Arrington's alleged victims. According to investigators, the day before the deadly standoff, the 22-year-old murdered 61-year-old pastor Anthony Watts in Jackson. Tragically, it's believed that Anthony was shot multiple times by Arrington after he pulled over to help him at the scene of a vehicle wreck. After gunning down Anthony, Arrington reportedly stole his red pickup truck and fled. Following news of Arrington's death on April 27th, investigators announced that a second one of the fugitives had been located. This man, 51-year-old Jerry Raines, had managed to make it more than 400 miles to Houston, Texas, that was located after a truck he allegedly stole was found abandoned in Spring Valley and was traced back to Mississippi. Raines was found at a hospital in Houston Heights where he reportedly went to seek treatment for a medical issue. He was arrested before he could be discharged. At the time of this recording, the remaining two suspects, 24-year-old Casey Grayson and 22-year-old Corey Harrison, remain at large. Currently, little information has been provided to the public about their possible whereabouts. The situation is still developing. Authorities in Hendricks County, Indiana, say that a 59-year-old woman is lucky to be alive this week after she was the victim of a brutal attack allegedly committed by her adult son. According to reports, the incident began at around 12.30 p.m. on April 24th when police in the city of Brownsburg were called to a home on the 1500 block of Midnight Pass with a report of a stabbing. When officers arrived, they found 59-year-old Susan Early lying on the grass outside of her residence. She was being tended to by concerned neighbors who came running to help when they heard her screams. Disturbingly, Susan had a large kitchen knife lodged in her head, as well as several other stab wounds. Despite her grisly injuries, Susan was remarkably awake and alert, and was able to relate to police what had allegedly happened. She stated that her 31-year-old son, Kyle Braun, had beaten and stabbed her in her kitchen. Witnesses pointed officers in the direction that the 31-year-old had run after the attack, and he was arrested following a brief search. Susan, meanwhile, was rushed to the hospital in critical condition, where she underwent emergency surgery. While no definitive information is currently available about what motivated the terrifying incident, multiple sources have so far reported that Braun has a history of psychiatric and anger issues. He was recently placed in a mental health facility in Ohio while on parole for unrelated crimes, though apparently managed to escape after cutting off his GPS monitor. The last time he had been seen prior to this week's incident was March 23rd. Braun is now facing charges of attempted murder as well as two counts of battery by bodily waste after allegedly spitting on an officer during his arrest. Representatives from the NYPD say that the tragic story of a woman who they initially believed had taken her own life took an even darker turn this week when it was revealed that investigators had now arrested and charged her elderly husband with her murder. 
According to reports, the incident began at around 10.15 p.m. on April 23rd when police were called to a residence on Blythe Place near Cotter Avenue in Staten Island's Richmond neighborhood. Officers arrived to find three members of the same family suffering from knife wounds. 71-year-old Ming Chen, his wife, 62-year-old Xiao Chongjing, and their 41-year-old son, who has not been identified by name. All three were taken to local hospitals, though sadly, Jing was later pronounced dead from her injuries. Initially, authorities were apparently led to believe that Jing had taken her own life and that Chen and her 41-year-old son had been injured while trying to prevent her from hurting herself. However, a couple of days later, reports came out alleging that these early conclusions were wrong. After speaking to the 41-year-old son through a Mandarin translator, investigators apparently learned that they were actually dealing with a murder. The son, who lives in a separate part of the same house with his own family, reportedly rushed to his parents' bedroom on the night of the incident when he heard them arguing. When he found the door locked, he allegedly forced his way inside, only to find his mother on the floor bleeding and his father holding a knife. He was injured while trying to wrestle the weapon away from his father. Chen's stab wounds, meanwhile, were allegedly self-inflicted, something which he apparently later confessed to police. While little is known about the motive behind the alleged crime, it's said that Chen is now facing several charges, including murder, assault, menacing, and criminal possession of a weapon. Authorities in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, say that two people have been arrested and are facing charges this week after they planned and carried out the chilling murder of a 35-year-old mother and beloved elementary school teacher in front of her young son. According to reports, the disturbing crime took place on the morning of April 11th when 35-year-old Rachel King and her 11-year-old son left their home in Elkins Park. The pair got into their SUV and drove about two miles to a Dunkin' Donuts location in the Melrose Shopping Center. They were waiting in the drive through line when out of nowhere, a man walked up to the driver's side window of the SUV and fired six shots at close range. Sadly, Rachel died from her injuries. Her 11-year-old son was physically unharmed as he was sitting in the back seat, though was forced to helplessly watch as the entire horrifying situation played out. The incident only got more chilling, however, when investigators learned the alleged motive behind the crime. They now say that the murder was part of a twisted revenge plot targeted at Rachel and her boyfriend. According to detectives, sometime last year, Rachel's boyfriend was involved in an affair with a 34-year-old woman named Julie Jean. When Rachel found out about the relationship, the boyfriend cut things off with Jean. However, things turned ugly. Jean began to harass both of them, causing the boyfriend to obtain a protection from abuse order against her. Still unable to let things go, authorities allege that Jean sought the help of 33-year-old Zaki Alakim, a cousin of her children's father. For the next several months, the two of them reportedly plotted Rachel's murder as revenge for her boyfriend ending his and Jean's affair. On the morning of the killing, Alakim reportedly followed Rachel from her home and tailed her to the Dunkin' Donuts drive through Once she was in line, he parked a short distance away, walked over with a firearm in hand, and allegedly shot her to death. Police say that Alakim was arrested on the same day as the murder after he crashed his vehicle into a fence during a police chase just a few miles south of the crime scene. At the time, officers were reportedly trying to pull him over because his vehicle matched the description of one involved in another murder case that had taken place just a few days earlier. Alakim has now been charged in connection with that case as well. Following Alakim's arrest, detectives reportedly uncovered a wealth of incriminating evidence on his phone connected to Rachel's murder. This included photos of her, a Google Maps screenshot of her apartment, and text message communications with Julie Jean. Authorities allege that Jean tried to destroy evidence of these communications, deleting nearly 800 messages just 13 minutes before she was questioned in connection with the killing. However, police were able to recover most of them. At the time of this recording, Jean and Alakim have both been charged with first-degree murder, third-degree murder, and conspiracy. Al-Hakim has also been slapped with a further charge of possessing an instrument of crime. (laughs) 
A 36-year-old Arkansas woman has reportedly been charged in connection with a stomach-churning case this week after authorities alleged that she sold nearly two dozen boxes of stolen human remains to a Pennsylvania man that she met on Facebook. The news comes from a recently unsealed indictment which accuses 36-year-old Candace Chapman Scott of using her position as a mortuary worker to obtain the illicit body parts. According to reports, Scott was formerly employed by Arkansas Central Mortuary Services and part of her job included transporting, cremating, and embalming remains. One of the funeral home's largest contracts is with the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences who send the remains of cadavers used by their medical students when their scientific use is complete. However, starting in October of 2021, authorities alleged that Scott began to steal some of these remains, selling them on the side for personal profit rather than properly cremating them as intended. According to investigators, Scott began the scheme by reaching out to a Pennsylvania man named Jeremy Lee Pauley, she reportedly met Polly through a Facebook group dedicated to oddities. Her first message read, quote, Just out of curiosity, would you know anyone in the market for a fully intact, embalmed brain? The indictment against Scott chillingly states that over the next nine months, she sold Polly at least 20 boxes of these stolen human remains, which included fetuses, brains, hearts, lungs, skin, and other body parts. During this time, she reportedly received payments from Polly totaling nearly $11,000. The pair were allegedly busted after Pennsylvania officials received complaints about Polly. At the time of this recording, Scott remains in custody and has pleaded not guilty to 12 counts, including mail fraud, wire fraud, and interstate transportation of stolen property. Polly, meanwhile, was arrested in Pennsylvania and charged with a misdemeanor count of abuse of a corpse, a felony count of receiving stolen property, a misdemeanor account of receiving stolen property, and a felony count of dealing in proceeds of unlawful activities. Authorities in Orange County, California, say that a 46-year-old man is facing charges this week after he allegedly stole a forklift from a local construction site and went on a dangerous rampage. According to reports, the incident began at around 7 p.m. on April 25th when police received calls about a man operating what appeared to be a stolen forklift in the city of Costa Mesa. The suspect, later identified as 46-year-old Matthew Shore, had allegedly taken the vehicle from a construction site on Rochester Street, getting it out onto the road by crashing through a chain-link fence. After taking a sizable amount of the fence with him, Shore proceeded to drive around on local roads, where he reportedly collided with a car and attempted to ram into pedestrians. Upon managing to shake the fence off of the front of the forklift, authorities say he drove onto the Pacific Coast Highway. Shore reportedly continued for about three miles until he stopped at a McDonald's location in Newport Beach. He was apparently arrested after illegally parking the stolen piece of construction equipment right outside of the fast food restaurant while he was waiting for his order of two McDoubles. At the time of this recording, police say that the motive behind the bizarre crime is unknown, though they do not believe Shore was under the influence of drugs or alcohol at the time of his arrest. He is now facing multiple charges, including vehicle theft, burglary, and felony vandalism. Authorities in Gainesville, Georgia, say that a 31-year-old man is facing murder charges this week after the body of his wife was found under chilling circumstances in their home the day after their first wedding anniversary. According to reports, April 14th was supposed to be a happy milestone for 32-year-old Casey Allen and her 31-year-old husband, Christopher Dean Snow. The pair had just had their first child together in late December and were celebrating their first wedding anniversary. To commemorate the day, the couple reportedly planned a rare day to themselves. They dropped off their four-month-old with Snow's aunt, and Casey's three other children from a previous marriage went to spend the weekend with their father. From there, the couple went to Build-A-Bear and made a stuffed owl together, saw a show at a comedy club, and had dinner before heading home. 
Both of them made posts that day to social media, professing their love for one another. However, Casey's, which described the first year of their marriage in part as, quote, a year of survival, would soon take on a far more ominous tone. The following morning, Snow showed up at his aunt's house and told her that he and Casey had a big fight. He claimed he couldn't find her, and the aunt called police for a welfare check at their apartment. When police went inside, they made a horrifying discovery. Casey was dead. She had been brutally beaten and stabbed numerous times. Police caught up with Snow a short time later, after he was involved in a serious car crash on Interstate 85 outside of Atlanta. He survived, but authorities now allege that the 31-year-old was trying to take his own life by crashing into a highway median at high speed. Snow was hospitalized for several days before being formally arrested on April 19th. While no motive behind the tragic killing has been confirmed at the time of this recording, family members of Casey's say that there were warning signs prior to the crime. Her sister Tiffany stated in an interview with local media that Casey admitted that Snow had been physical with her prior to their marriage. Casey reportedly claimed that it was just one time and that her sister had nothing to worry about. Tiffany said that by all accounts, it seemed like they were a happy couple. Snow was now facing several charges in connection with Casey's death, including felony murder, aggravated battery of a spouse, aggravated assault of a spouse, and probation violation. Authorities in San Jacinto County, Texas, say that they are on the hunt for an armed and dangerous man this week after he allegedly murdered five people in a senseless act of violence when he was asked by a neighbor to stop shooting his gun late at night. According to reports, the incident took place sometime before midnight on April 28th when police in the city of Cleveland were called about a harassment claim in the Trails End neighborhood. They were on their way to investigate when a flood of further 911 calls started coming in, informing them that the situation had escalated. Multiple people had now been shot. When officers arrived at the scene, they encountered a horrifying situation. Four people were dead inside of a home, and a fifth, an eight-year-old boy, needed to be airlifted to a nearby hospital. Sadly, he also died of his injuries. After speaking with witnesses and survivors of the terrifying incident, police learned that the whole thing had started at about 11.30 p.m. that night, when a man named Wilson Garcia had tried to speak with his neighbor, 38-year-old Francisco Oropesa. Oropesa was reportedly shooting a rifle on his front porch, and Garcia had asked him to stop because he and his wife were trying to put their baby to sleep. It's alleged that Oropesa, who was said to have been drinking at the time, refused to stop saying that he could do whatever he wanted to in his yard. When Garcia informed Oropesa that he would be calling the police to complain, the 38-year-old reportedly grabbed his weapon, marched over to Garcia's house, and opened fire at everyone inside. According to reports, there were 10 people in the residence at the time of the shooting, five of whom were children. The victims have since been identified as 21-year-old Diana Alvarado, 31-year-old Julisa Rivera, 18-year-old Jose Casares and Garcia's wife and son, 25-year-old Sonia, and 8-year-old Daniel. It appears that Garcia was the only adult who survived the unimaginable ordeal. Apparently, he managed to escape thanks to one of the female victims who urged him to jump out of a window of their house. By this point, Garcia's wife had already been killed, and heartbreakingly, the woman reportedly told him that his children needed at least one parent to survive. It said that two of the female victims were killed while trying to protect the kids that were in the house. Though police were initially able to track Oropesa to a wooded area about a mile from the crime scene following the shooting, frustratingly, it appears that at some point they lost his trail. At the time of this recording, the 38-year-old remains at large and is the subject of a massive manhunt. Anyone with information concerning Oropesa's whereabouts is encouraged to contact police immediately. He is considered armed and dangerous, and members of the public are being cautioned not to approach him. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. 
If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.